Now, imagine eyewitness accounts and video records uh, reveal live ammunition were fired into the crowd in the Tichiman South shooting, which killed two people. Videos available to join you show some military and police personnel firing directly into the crowd in the December 8th incident. Some eyewitnesses give horrifying accounts of how the joy of observing the collation of electoral results turned into a mass shooting. Lava firms Erastus Saridonko spent days in Tichiman speaking to eyewitnesses and collecting videos of the incident and has filed this report. Most parts of the Tichiman South constituency were calm and peaceful on voting day. After polling station results had been declared, all roads led to this place where the collation of results took place under the strict eye of the public. This is the Bono Champion Hall in the Techiman South constituency. This is where collation of electoral results happened. Throughout the night, supporters of both NDC and NPP kept vigil observing collation of results. But the collation night will soon turn chaotic. Security agents fired warning shots to maintain calm as supporters of both parties fought and destroyed ballot boxes containing results from some polling stations. Alaji is an election observer. A late hour, somewhere around 11.30 will be 12. There was an allegation that some boxes were coming. And some, some team youth were here protesting that those boxes shouldn't go into the coalition center. So all of a sudden, there was a struggle. Others were like the boxes would come in, others were like the boxes would not come yeah, between in. The MPP and between NDC. the MPP and NDC. Supporters who are outside. Supporters here. who were outside. So there was a struggle, there was a fight, and there was even a gunshot that night. Fired so, by who? by the police just to scare the supporters so at the end they fought and broke those boxes the ballot boxes those ballot boxes the papers were flying away everywhere december 8 2020 a day after voting was pregnant with expectations Supporters of the NDC and NPP gathered outside the collation center in anticipation of who won. The NDC supporters, their team inside the collation center was saying that they were not satisfied with those boxes or the results in those boxes. So it was like an argument back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until later in the evening when those results were added. NPP had 49,683, the parliamentary candidate. And the NDC parliamentary candidate had 49,205. And so immediately they shoot it out, the jubilation started. So the team youth of the NDC who were also standing here were angry. Ah, how comes? Because they know that they, so they were trying to force in to the hall. So they were here? They were on the left here. They, they were standing the left, here? Yes. In their, numbers. in their numbers. And they wanted to force their way into this hall? Into the hall. And the MPP supporters too were also on the right. But the military and the police, they were in the middle, trying to protect the crowd not to move in. Some accounts say party supporters started pelting stones at the security personnel. Others also say the supporters were forcing their way into the collation hall. But what happened next will remain a black day in the political history of Techiman South. This video shows protest from the crowd. Then the shooting starts. A journalist who witnessed the shooting from the front of the collation center gave this narration. The police started the warning shots, then the uh, military also complied. So some of the guns were pointed upwards and some to, uh, you know, through the, the crowd. I saw one guy lying down here. Blood was oozing from the nose and the eyes. At that time, he was breathing very slowly. So in about, in about our time that we, we, we understood, there were many, uh, you know, supporters being victimized uh, through gunshots.
a closer and critical look at this video which marked the beginning of the firing of warning shots show the crowd retreating whilst many of the personnel are seen firing into the air this officer in seeming police colored uniform is seen aiming at the crowd Another amateur video captures the fleeting moment when shots were fired into the crowd and the moment when some supporters were seen lying motionless on the ground. We tried to slow the video to pay attention to detail. Here, it reveals many of the security personnel firing their guns into the air. But this military officer fires directly into the crowd. The originator of the video is heard saying some are dead and then laughs as the video ends. At this point, the crowd is stunned. Some are seen carrying the injured to safety. This woman seen here in the video helping lift a fallen supporter describes that moment. Eighteen-year-old Abdullah Ayarek, an apprentice in the street lighting business, and Mohammed Tajuddin, forty-one, a father of four, were killed. Nine others sustained various degrees of injuries. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko, Kumasi. This uh, criminal investigations department says it is still conducting investigations to unravel persons behind the shooting at the Tichiman South Coalition Center. Listen to Director General of CID, COP, Isaac Kenny Abua, when he addressed the news conference last week. Eight male adults were injured in the process. Police called the National Ambulance Team, which was standing by the center, and the victims were rushed to Holy Family Hospital for treatment. However, Abdallah Ayarek and Tajuddin Mohammed were pronounced dead on arrival. But our investigation so far revealed that Whilst the electoral officials were collating the results at about 15, 40 hours, the results were projected as follows. 49,582 for the MPP parliamentary candidate, 49,205 for the MDC parliamentary candidate. Supporters of the NDC who had gathered outside the hall became angry and started attacking the center with stones and other offensive weapons. They broke the cordoned zone and forced their way into the coalition center. And that was when the shot was fired from the crowd and the police personnel detailed to safeguard the center also gave warning shots. And then after the routers had left the place, eight male adults were injured. I must say that the police are still investigating to find out who actually committed the offense. You heard the Director General of CID, COP, Isaac Kenyaboa, the Well, joining us in the studio is Security Analyst and Executive Director of the Jatike Center for Human Security and Peace Building, Adib Sani. Good to see you. Good to see you, Aisha. Um, you've just seen videos at Techiman South uh, pointing to sporadic shooting into the crowd that led to two deaths and several injuries. What's your own appreciation of the aftermath of the just ended election, especially the violence events? Well, um, Aisha, there are three stages of election security. Um, Pre-election, then the security provided on election day and post-election security. Um, I have personally keenly followed uh, activities of the various security uh, agencies, especially that of the 
National Election Security Tax Force, chaired, chaired by the IGP. Mm. He held a news conference on, on the 4th of uh, November in which he catalogued a series of activities that has been embarked upon already and, of course, those yet to be embarked upon before and during the election to maintain law and order. But of all of these, I have come to one realization. We didn't have a post-election security strategy. The focus was much more on the pre-election and election day. As a result, immediately after the elections, um, most of the officers deployed were asked to return to base, and I think almost all of them were given a day or two leave. Um, from the years I have practiced as a security person, and of course, as a student of security, who is a member of the AU mediators rule, I have personally keenly followed a lot of elections in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. Uh, and I have also come to one realization. Most of the violence happens after the elections. Mm. Like in Kenya uh, in 2007, Ivory Coast in 2010, which culminated into a civil war in 2011, uh, Nigeria in 2003, and a whole host of other countries. As a matter of fact, we don't have to go beyond Ghana to learn lessons. We all witnessed what happened after the 2016 elections when we had, you know, marauding youth flagrantly disregarding the law and, you know, besieging state buildings, including toilet facilities and toll booths. So I expected at least we'd maintain some level of security presence mm. even after the elections. And I am particularly not surprised whatsoever this is happening. And I categorically said it on my Facebook page and it's still there for all to see. Mm. I said that before the announcement of the results, I said that after the announcement of the results, there's likely to be disruption. Okay. And I also uh, added that uh, I don't know the extent to which the disruption would be, but of course we needed to be extremely careful. And I got the barrage of critics, you know, in my inbox, in my comment section, calling me all sorts of names, describing me as a doomonger. And the this evil year. one. And, and that is exactly what, you know, some of us, we speak from an independent angle. And um, we are not politically skewed. So we speak based on science and not emotions. Mm. So we, we saw this coming, coming and I'm not surprised whatsoever this is happening. Mm. But I mean, it's a great story by uh, uh, Erastus Donko. Um, I wanted to be sure whether the officer who pointed the gun at the protesters really fired. And I'm shocked he fired. Mm. That is no warning shot. You know, there's one analysis that one of the conflict resolution guys gave, and I think it's something we should all ponder over. He said, in many of the instances, if you look at what is happening, you don't see um, supporters of both political parties, the major political parties, actually clashing. But you see that it's either security agents or security personnel or some supposedly security people actually shooting or having that kind of clash with the supporters. And that is where we must actually channel our uh, energies towards, yeah. that it's not the two political parties. And who is assigning these um, um, security analysts, who is going to speak for them to lay down their tools so that people will stop dying yeah. from, I mean, after the elections. You know, Aisha, your points are very valid and legitimate uh, also, because the more force we use in certain situations, the more we are likely to provoke more protests. Yeah. And even if you look at the fundamentals of policing, the nine pillion principles of modern day policing, uh, is hinged around the fact that the more force you use, the less you're likely to get the people to cooperate with you. So mm -hmm. I think this raises the need for security agents to be very professional in their approach mm -hmm. to some of these protests. Um, they need to exercise restraint as much as they can. Uh, so far, I think uh, the ones I have personally witnessed, like what happened at the uh, Electoral Commission headquarters last week, I was personally there. I saw protesters breaching the perimeter and throwing stones. Okay. But uh, in the face of all that, the security officers, they exercised um, uh, restraint and they used minimal 
force, force. even though a stone can kill. Yeah. Uh, they had every justification to use lethal force, but they still maintain that posture. Because what we are trying to avoid here is more casualties, more people dying. Mm -hmm. The gentleman who died at uh, the hospital recently, who was shot at Ablikuma, I know him. Central. I know him so well. Mm. He came to my house uh, somewhere in February when I had an outdoor in, and I was shocked uh, to hear of, uh, of what really happened to him. So security agencies uh, have to be really uh, professional in, in their approach. But you see, if you are well trained, you would also know how to de-escalate some of these uh, 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 protests. Because sometimes in certain situations, you see there's a potential of violence. But if the officer is well trained, he's able to, through diplomatic means, mm. de-escalate. But once you feel that the protesters have adopted the Buga Buga strategy, so <laughs> I would also go the Buga Buga way, you might end up, you know, messing up the whole thing altogether. Mm. Like it happened at the Electoral Commission headquarters on the day the announcement, the results were going to be announced. Yeah. I mean, I realized the security agents there also. Uh, were very restrained. We, we had the military guys pleading with the pro protesters to, you know, calm down and all mm. that. That is the way to go. Mm -hmm. But we don't have people dying and you claiming you were firing in the air to scare them. You don't, you don't fire warning shots to kill. Then yeah. it's no longer warning. And that is exactly what happened at uh, Techiman and Ablikuma. And whose duty is it to check those um behaving unprofessionally um you know towards people who are exercising their democratic rights because of course um some of them have gone overboard which we condemn but these demonstrations these protests are also their constitutional rights it is in the constitution that people can protest people i've heard a lot of people say go to court and let the people stop protesting but the lawyers also will tell you that this also is not a wrong um, what you call step to take because it is also a constitutional right that the uh, citizenry has but you've also sent a signal that as we go to parliament and we know what has happened the interesting path that the parliament has taken both political parties have um, they've split the seats 137 137 and you have called for extra security for members of parliament why now well in the past uh, if you follow me uh, closely. I was one of the most outspoken persons against the provision of security to MPs because uh, I contended that we have a wider uh, issue of insecurity you know, in our societies and when we are able to deal with it holistically, it would inure to the benefit of parliamentarians mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. But like I always say, security is a process, it's not an event. Things have changed, new issues have emerged. Mm. Currently, as it stands, from official sources, mm. even though it is contested, yeah. uh, NDC has about 137 parliamentarians, whilst the MPP has, including uh, the independent, 138. Mm. So uh, the power balance is so precarious, mm. okay? And the possibility that if, for instance, God forbid, in the unfortunate event, okay, that two MPs die from the NPP and they go for a by-election and uh, the, the new persons elected are NDC. What it actually means is invariably uh, power would shift to the side of the NDC. Mm. We know people in invest so much in uh, politics. Even as it stands now, it just looks like um, they all have 137, even though when they meet in caucus or when they are voting, the independent candidates can vote. It doesn't necessarily mean that the independent candidate can sit with the NPP because the uh, standing orders does not actually make provisions for that. If he was with a party, then I'm told that he can easily join the NPP. But as an independent candidate, once he does that, then they would have to, uh, they would have to, would have to be a by-election because yeah. it means that he has actually, you know, vacated his seat as an independent candidate. So it will be very interesting and, to and, see and how Russia, it pans out Russia, in Parliament. That even makes it more precarious, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. So people would use any means possible to grab power, even yeah. if it means eliminating some political so-called adversaries. Yeah. That is why it is important 
than never before yeah. for parliamentarians to take their security seriously. I am very much in favor of security given to parliamentarians by the police, but mm. the bulk of the work would be on them at the very personal level, exercising a great deal of discretion so far as their personal security mm. is concerned. Okay. I mean, people can come after you in different ways, make it look like an armed robbery, kill you, and everybody would report it's an armed robbery. Meanwhile, yeah. they were sent, or a home invasion Contract gone only. bad. Home invasion mm. gone bad. Mm. Meanwhile, they were, you know, sent. And it's happened before, and the likelihood it might happen again is quite high. So mm. the need for them to be extremely careful mm. and to take extra precautions. Well, what do you recommend? I mean, which form should the security you ask for take? No, I am a security consultant myself, and I run a security company. About 90% of my clients are people who have been affected by crime. Okay. That is when you see them running, uh, mm. co coming to you. Mm. When Professor Bennett was killed at East Ligon, I had a lot of East Ligon clients. I mean, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to wait for things so, to get out of hand. So they need to be proactive, okay? Need to improve their surveillance systems at home. And this is based on a criminology theory called rational choice. Before someone perpetrates a crime, he's able to juxtapose between the reward and the risk factors. Mm. So the risk factors, that is the possibility of him getting caught. If it okay. outweighs the reward factors, mm. the person might have to advise himself and be disincentivized from even conducting okay. or perpetrating the act. Mm. Uh, they need to be cautious of their movements, especially late at night. Uh, when they get home, they don't have to wait outside the gates. And I know, Aisha, you are guilty of this too. <laughs> you don't have to wait outside to call someone for the person to, to come, come open the gates. If you can use the automated, automated gates with a remote, yeah. remote, even if it is raining, you are able to open, open and enter. And some actually even park their cars outside while the engine is running, they step out, go open the main the gates gate, which before is coming. Very risky. And a lot of car snatching, jacking incidents happen I as a result I'm of, of that. Right, so yeah. at the very personal level, they need to exercise that discretion. Mm. So after elections, we find ourselves in this uh, uh, crossroads. People are still protesting. Every day you're hearing people are being injured. Yesterday in Kumasi, a number of people were arrested. How do we move from here? How do we resolve this crisis? Well, Aisha, um, before I came to the studio, I've been doing my own research on uh, protest. And according to the center and our, uh, your viewers, I, I would wish they go look at the document mm. uh, published by the Center for uh, Strategic and International uh, uh, Studies. Okay. And they described this era as a, an era of uh, protest. And this year, over 37 countries have had serious protests. Mm. Um, America alone has seen a 186% increase in uh, protest. Okay. Uh, Vietnam is one of the few countries uh, protest rarely happens. But mm. on this occasion, because of uh, an oil rig in the South China Sea, they saw really violent protest. Okay. So it is something we can expect. However, we've always dealt with it superficially. Mm. Oh, let's disperse them. I think it should go beyond just dispersing them. We would have to get notable, well-respected people within our society to mm -hmm. step in, like the chief imam, okay. like uh, the Asante Hini. Uh, you would have to call on the politicians to be very careful about what they say. Because yeah. politicians are like celebrities. Uh, they are like religious men. Whatever they say has a direct bearing. It has a direct correlation in the thought processes, the opinions and perceptions about uh, you know, certain issues. Mm. Okay? So whatever they say is what is provoking the reaction from their followers, who they inspire. Yeah. So politicians would have to be very careful about what they say. Mm. Um, it is also very important, in as much as the law guarantees you that right to protest, we need to follow due process. And be responsible. The Public Order Act mm -hmm. uh, 491 yeah. is quite categorical about not seeking permission from the police, but to inform them, and you know the rationale, to ensure your safety. To ensure it your safety. It is not the pleasure well. of, of the uh, police. So we need to follow uh, these protocols. And we need to be peaceful. You don't have to throw stones because uh, you might be right, but your reaction, you might end up being wrong yeah. because of the way you, you, you react to some of these things. I think there's the need for backdoor uh, diplomacy. Okay. Uh, uh, engage the, the various major political the two parties. Various, uh, the two major political parties. So at least they are able to reach a consensus. If they are going to court, fine. If they don't intend going to court, what is the way forward? Because yeah. the question I ask myself is, all this violence, to what end? To what end? And, and someone's all saying a crack, right? 
And of course, I mean, going forward, we'll be looking at how this all of this pan out. Don't forget that on the 7th of January, we are inaugurating the president and we don't want to cross the 7th of January with all these um, uh, mishaps. We want it fixed. Thank you so much. Um, Adib Sani is Executive Director of Jatike Center for Human Security and Peace Building and a Security Analyst as well.